In this episode, we discuss how an epic failure during a location shoot resulted in the construction of this ingenious prop, which still survives today. And we reveal a previously unknown fact about effects work in one of the missing episodes. If this sounds like your kind of video, make sure you subscribe, as you won't want to miss episode 2. In November 1964, the second Doctor Who serial featuring the Daleks began, and in the days leading up to Christmas, their creator Terry Nation was commissioned to write a third serial. It was initially called The Pursuers. That story would eventually become The Chase, and as a tease for their return, a dead Dalek was shown in two episodes of the preceding adventure, The Space Museum. Scenes were shot with this empty prop on the 2nd of April and the 9th of April 1965. It would be the final appearance of the Daleks without their solar panels, but it was the first time the ping pong ball lights were replaced with these domes. The very same day that William Hartnell was in studio recording these memorable moments, a film location crew loaded up a BBC van with two Daleks and a collection of abstract sculptures and made the approximately three hour journey down to the south coast of England. The team included at least two visual effects technicians, plus the director, cameraman, other crew, and the performers David Newman and Barbara Joss. Their destination, not far from the town of Rye, was the small village of Camber, which was selected to portray the alien world of Iridius. It was the first time that a real place had been used as a setting for another planet, and unlike many future adventures, this location shoot did not take place in a quarry. Camber's coast has a stretch of dunes not often seen in the UK, and this worked perfectly as the desert world. To augment the desolate landscape, the strange sculptures were scattered about. We tried to make it look mysterious by uh, putting these uh, atrophied gargoyles into the middle distance. We were only half successful. And they either came from stock or were created in-house by the BBC, since they do not appear on paperwork showing the visual effects costs from the outside contractors. The three contractors who worked on the chase were Shawcraft, who built the Daleks, Derek Freeborn, whose work on the programme has always remained uncredited, and TechAd Film and Television Products Limited, who were specialists in models and displays and based in Oxford Street. One item which appears on the inventory is a three-foot-high TARDIS, which was an existing prop adapted for battery lighting, as this was the first time it had been used outside the studio. Newman and Joss were needed to double for Ian and Vicky, respectively, since the actors William Russell and Maureen O'Brien were in studio that day recording the Space Museum, Although, interestingly, O'Brien said she vividly remembers going on the location trip. This yeah, is yeah. the only day's filming I remember in the whole of my time. We went out for one day to the seaside with Richard and we played yeah. on the sands. Yeah. I remember going up that sand dune, it was so exciting. I think that quite often the memory cheats. In the script for episode one, a sandstorm has buried the TARDIS and very nearly the Doctor and Barbara too. As the pair are about to set off to look for it, their adversaries are revealed in dramatic fashion. The script states that from beneath a heap of sand, a Dalek emerges. It is often said that Terry Nation began a tradition of introducing his creations in different and dramatic ways, starting with one rising out of the Thames in the Dalek invasion of Earth, but this is not the case. As Jonathan Morris proves in his superb Black Archive book, Terry Nation's draft of the episode 1 cliffhanger for the Dalek invasion of Earth has the Daleks revealed when their saucer lands and the ramp descends. The scene with the underwater Dalek was not added until David Whittaker performed his rewrites, at which stage he added many other famous elements, which would later be attributed to Terry Nation because it's his name on the credits. For the dramatic reveal of the Dalek emerging from the sand in the chase, director Richard Martin was determined to achieve this on location using a full-size prop, and he wanted the Dalek to, be, uh, to come out of the sand. We tried to explain to him that if you half bury the, the Dalek in the sand, there's a certain sort of suction that builds up and it'd be impossible to pull out. Crew members dutifully began digging out a section of one of the dunes. This photo shows the process, with the excavation in the background and the pristine new prop ready for its burial. The Dalek in question was the seventh prop to be built, 
and was designed to be light enough to be walked across the sand, since the usual method of propulsion on casters would not work on this terrain. For this reason, it's termed a hover Dalek on the paperwork, and Shawcraft charged the BBC £130. Bill Roberts, who owned Shawcraft, would later describe the seventh Dalek as a spare which they had lying around. From this point onwards, Shawcraft always retained a Dalek at their workshop. It's surprising that the BBC paid full price for a new Dalek which Shawcraft then kept. With the hole excavated, Dalek number 7 was half covered over in sand and the technicians affixed a cable to the base. According to Ray Kusick, a Land Rover was driven onto the beach and the crew attempted to pull the prop out of the sandbank. But, due to the weight of the sand, the cable snapped and the effect had to be abandoned. The day's shooting continued with the other Dalek footage, including this shot of the prop hovering over the dunes. As it reaches the camera, it is clearly still caked in sand from its unsuccessful burial. The final shot to be achieved with this prop was that of the Dalek falling into the trap set by Ian and the Doctor. For this sequence, a special spring-loaded mechanism was built, through which the Dalek could fall. The cost of construction was £36. The mechanism and the men operating it were concealed behind a split-screen effect, and the superimposed rocky landscape remains steady while the real horizon can just be seen moving slightly in the background. The visual effects team's other contribution to that day was the pyrotechnics work, where they were briefed to provide a large underground explosion. It's not known which of the three contractors was in charge of this, but the cost was £25. One wonders what the nearby holidaymakers thought of all this action. The three contractors' total labour costs for the trip to Camber Sands was £52. So what happened to Sandy the Hover Dalek? Three days later, the next batch of filming began indoors at Ealing. The four main Daleks were refurbished at a cost of £118. However, this was subsidised by the BBC Publicity Department to the tune of £100, so the cost of the Doctor Who production was only £18. An additional Dalek was to be furnished by Shawcraft for the purpose of repeated destruction. This constituted several hero parts, plus sets of dummy shoulders which could be destroyed in the battle with the mechanoids. The effects Dalek parts were supplied at a cost of £56. In addition, the Hover Dalek number 7 was used for these scenes on the Mary Celeste, where it ultimately pitched into the water tank. Director Richard Martin was not happy revealing the true nature of how a Dalek prop was put together. The damn thing's breaking apart there, which was very obviously a weakness and looked um, cheap when it happened. You could see there was nothing inside. I think it was a shame. If we knew it was going to break there, we should have had some, the globule Dalek inside. But this would not be its final appearance, as it was later used in studio for this stunt with Frankenstein's monster. Here the casing would split open once again, and in retrospect, director Richard Martin felt a more impressive special effect could have been achieved. When that happened, it showed that it was empty, uh, which reduced it. Whereas if you'd had its guts spilt out, enormous complex electrodes onto the floor, that would have been quite fun. And although it didn't appear in the Dalek master plan, as far as we know, it did re-emerge in Power of the Daleks as one of the fully-fledged hero props. From there, it went on to have a distinguished career throughout Doctor Who history until it made its final screen appearance in Remembrance of the Daleks although with its components split between two different props. Each half still survives in its remembrance of the Dalek's appearance, with one owned by Chris Balcom, and another last seen appearing in 2011 on the TV series Four Rooms. But having failed in its task to emerge from the sand dunes in a dramatic reveal, this effect therefore had to be accomplished another way. Designer Ray Kusick turned to Shawcraft to supply a miniature Dalek which they could shoot on a model set instead. At a cost of £85, Shawcraft provided this model. Only one Dalek miniature had ever been built before, which was this one for the Dalek invasion of Earth. The miniature built for the chase was much larger, at approximately 45cm in height, and it was also more sophisticated. Although the shape of the miniature is not a perfect replication of a full-size Dalek, the level of detail is exceptional, and it even includes tiny rivets on the solar slats. 
The majority of the prop is made from wood, with some plastic pieces for the finer parts. The dome was articulated so it can rotate, and a rod was mounted up through the centre of the prop so it could be operated from below. The eye was made to pivot and it could look up and down. At the film shoot in the Ealing Studios, a tank was set up and a desert landscape was created in miniature. A hole was cut in the base, and the Dalek and its pole were mounted on the end of a mechanism which pushed the prop up through the table. Director Richard Martin takes up the story. We had it on a long plank, in fact, and we, uh, which was fulcrumed, and it just pushed up. Uh, but it wasn't easy, and it, it wasn't uh, uh, achieved immediately. We had to have various versions before we, before the plank didn't appear. I wanted that Dalek because it was only it was only about what is it about 18 inches tall. I thought that would be the perfect thing. But Bill, who made them from uh, Shawcraft, he said that one's mine. He said the BBC <laughs> haven't paid me enough. And it proved to be wise thinking, as props which went back to Shawcraft could be used again. Which brings us forward in time six months to the next important event, recording of the subsequent Dalek serial, which was known briefly as The Daleks Part 4, later becoming The Daleks Master Plan. Episode 1 went before the cameras in Studio TC3 at the BBC's Television Centre on October the 22nd, 1965. At the start of that story, new companions Brett Vion and Katerina are inside the TARDIS along with the unconscious Stephen. I've disobeyed him. If Stephen, or whatever his name is, recovers, you'll be forgiven. And the doctor gets back here soon. No. As this episode is missing from the archive, we need the camera script to tell us what Brett reacts to, a Dalek standing in the clearing. But the camera script also reveals how this shot was achieved. It was done with a model Dalek, and not a full-size prop. The reason for this is that these episodes of Doctor Who were recorded almost as if they were live, and the four full-size Dalek props at that point were all in the reception hall set. So to have one of them appear just briefly in the jungle would have necessitated two costly recording breaks, to move it there and move it back again. So what model might have been used? Thanks to this never-before-seen photograph from the set of the Daleks' master plan, this question can be answered. Just as in the previous story, the cliffhanger to episode 1 was realised using the miniature built by Shawcraft and operated from beneath the table. Direct comparison of the two proves it's the same miniature built six months earlier. And in the background of this photo, you can see the prop of the Daleks' time destructor too. This is a rare glimpse of the special effects work of this lost episode. I wanted that dialogue. After its use in Master Plan, the Dalek model was retained by Bill Roberts. The BBC <laughs> hadn't paid me enough. And many years later, he donated it to a toy museum. The museum built this ingenious mechanism to automate the movement which had previously been done by hand allowing the Dalek to alarm visitors regularly. The museum closed in 1980, and the Dalek moved to a new home. After all these decades, the motor is still in perfect working order, and the alien menace which appeared on both Iridius and Kemble is now kept behind glass where it can be safely admired in the owner's home. hope you enjoyed our first episode and we'd like to say a huge thanks to the owner of the miniature for sharing its story with us and to Robert Q for the opportunity to share the rare master plan photo. We're very grateful to the people on Twitter who've helped us with resources and to Graham Allen who specially wrote the music. Tune in at 5.15 on Monday next week for more exciting adventures with the Daleks. The BBC <laughs> haven't paid me enough.